Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Harris uh, Lizidakis. I am uh, uh, the Chief Executive Officer uh, Designate of uh, the World Organization of Family Doctors, WONCA. Uh, and before we start uh, this uh, very first uh, webinar on uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, I would like to introduce you to controls on uh, Zoom uh, that you can uh, use to interact with us. Uh, on uh, the bottom of your screen, you will see two buttons, the chat and the Q&A. Uh, with the chat, you can exchange messages with, an, uh, with one another and with our panelists. With uh, the Q&A, on the other hand, you can ask questions um, uh, and uh, our panelists uh, will make uh, uh, their best effort to um, answer them via text. Uh, some of your questions um, will be also picked up and will be addressed out loud uh, from our panelists today. So without uh, further ado, I would like to introduce you to uh, the Chief Executive Officer of uh, Wonka World, uh, Dr. Garth Manning. Welcome everyone to the first of a series of formal Wonka webinars after a successful pilot last week. You're all very welcome. Today, we're going to hear from our president, president-elect and our regional presidents, who will give us a global overview of how COVID-19 is affecting different parts of the world. I'll introduce the regional presidents in turn, but first I'd like to hand over to our president, Dr. Donald Lee, for his opening remarks. Who will share with us, you know, their thoughts and experience uh, on the COVID-19. But as we listen to and take the advice of our public health colleagues, uh, Harris, can you put on the slide, please? My first slide. Perfect. This will be introduced by our chief executive later on, but the next slide, please. Yes, as we listen to and take the advice of our public health colleagues, family doctors around the world have risen to the challenge of this awful pandemic. In the midst of this massively increased workload for family doctors, I'm proud of the level of support and collegiality displayed within and across our member organizations and from region to region. It is heartening indeed. Next, please. Colleagues are disseminating scientific advice, clinical updates, reflective messages, and professional support through their social media links and connections. They are keeping in touch with each other regularly, like family members, relaying information, urging courage in these extraordinary times. Tonight, our regional presidents will share with you what family doctors have been facing and our contributions in combating this epidemic. Next, please. This is a pandemic with an unknown end game. I wish each and every one of our family doctors well during this time. Use the best advice available. Work collaboratively with your teams. Do the best you can for your patients. You should stand proud of your contributions to tackling this world crisis. No one knows what we will face in the weeks and months ahead, but everyone knows enough to understand that COVID-19 will test our capacities to be kind and generous and to see beyond ourselves and our own interests. Our task now is to bring the best of who we are and what we do to a world that is more complex and more confused than any of us would like it to be. May we all proceed with wisdom and grace. So we will start the first webinar today. We will have a few more and uh, we will let you know uh, our program at, towards the end. But now may I hand over to Garth to introduce our uh, regional presidents and speakers. 
Thank you very much, Donald. Um, so a reminder to the regional presidents that you've all got five minutes each, um, and I will be reasonably strict in terms of time so that we have plenty of time for questions and answers. Harris has described how the audience can interact through Q&A and through chat, and later on we will put some of the questions to the panel for comment. But I'd like to start with Professor Shabir Musa, who's the Wonka Africa president. So Shabir, over to you. Hi everyone, it's great to have you all here. I think it's, um, it's great to see the um, world global family medicine uh, uh, community coming together. And I think despite the difficulty of physical distance that we can all be together. Well, I'm the president of Wonka Africa um, and uh, Garth, if you can just uh, move to the next slide. And I think the key question is what's happening in Africa. It's certainly not uh, a place that um, is seeing a large number of cases yet. And I think that at the moment, uh, as of yesterday or two days ago, uh, we have only 12,800 across the entire uh, continent. I think you can see the hot spots. They've only been less than 1,000 deaths, 686, most of it concentrated in sub-Saharan Africa in South Africa. As you can see in the chart on the right hand side, that the trajectories in no ways um, um, logarithmic or exponential. So it's moving along in South Africa, but not as fast as I think uh, people expected. Of course, whether this is the calm before the storm is a big question. Next. I think that the WHO has certainly brought uh, to bear the difficulty that this region suffers from. And I think that the WHO Afro have circulated a newsletter focusing on COVID and pointing out some important difficulties that across the entire um, you know, African continent in the region itself, that ICU beds are actually in great, great limitation as well as um, ventilators. So should this uh, epidemic hit us as is happening in the rest of the world, we would indeed be having a very great difficulty. I think the age distribution of the cases so far are not very different from what's happening in the rest of the world. Next. I think that the implications though, despite the fact that it's not moving fast, the African government starting with the South African government have said that they need to act quickly for the sake of the continent that is so poorly equipped to deal with it. So in South Africa and across the continent, uh, preparations are moving ahead, um, both in terms of uh, ensuring that there's a strict limitation of movements with lockdowns, um, social isolation, um, a banning of large meetings, large gatherings, um, and encouragement of people to be able to engage in good hand washing um, and being able to identify the illness based on travel at the outset. Uh, at the moment, um, these uh, travel cases have been reduced and local transmission has been picked up. And this is the powder keg um, that people are preparing for. So at the moment, a lot of preparation is going into how the primary health care system um, responds. And I think there are lots of family physicians who are there across the continent um, who are looking at how primary health care uh, prepares for it, uh, triaging at the front gate, being able to ensure that there are red zones uh, created um, where COVID uh, suspects can be managed and allow that not to inter interfere with the rest of the function of primary care. I think at a societal level, um, there's huge problems with uh, overcrowding uh, transport systems that are difficult to manage with crowding in it, um, as well as um, just being able to have the health system ready should the scale of it grow with field hospitals, etc. So I think we are struggling with a lot of difficulties in Africa. Next. Um, the WHO has actually said, and this is the, the um, uh, Dr. Gabusis has actually pointed out, that South Africa, uh, that Africa will need a lot more resources to fight COVID. There's a very useful um, video, but I don't think it will, time will allow us to play it. But I think he says out clearly, Africa needs a lot more resources and the world may very well neglect Africa and when it hits us we may not have time to respond even at a global level um, and I think the speed at which it may move around uh, will be frightening indeed. Uh, next. 
our family physicians across the, the continent have been trying to do things. There have been country level responses. I think there have been responses that I've, I've known of in Kenya, in Ghana, in South Africa. Um, these are not just the, the responses of the government, um, which have been there, but these are responses by family doctors, organized family doctors, um, setting up guidelines, having activities that actually engage. Um, we've in fact um, looked at clinical webinars even in country, um, but at an Africa wide level, uh, Wonka Africa have set up a clinical webinar that is open to all in Africa using Zoom but also a weekly joint webinar with the WHO Afro and Global to look at country experiences in Africa on Fridays between 4 to 5 p.m. at South African Standard Time. And this has been running for three to four weeks and will continue. And I urge you all to join it to understand what are the difficulties and the challenges in each of the countries that we're going to go through. We're also exploring a weekly joint webinar with the PHCPI um, to explore the story of uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, in Africa and how primary health care is responding. So these are some of the responses. I think there are many more that I wouldn't give the document, but I think these are high level, the kinds of things that are happening uh, in the organization of the World Family, Organization of Family Doctors in Africa. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Shabir. That was a, a good start um, and, and interesting to hear. Uh, we'll move on to Asia Pacific region. Uh, Ming-Chi Lee, the president, um, sends his apologies, but he's in cl on clinical duties today. So Dr. Husni Jamal, who is the Asia Pacific region president elect, will present on the Asia Pacific situation. Thanks, Husni. Husni, you're, you're um, muted. So if you can unmute. Well, my topic is on the strategies and experiences of the COVID-19 pandemic in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, next slide, please. There is, uh, okay, the issue now is how do APR countries respond with this uh, pandemic, knowing very well that China was the epicenter. Uh, there are two groups actually that responded uh, um, in two different ways. And the first group is what I call it, those that reacted very immediately and very aggressively. And these are mainly from the Northeast Asian countries of Hong Kong, Taiwan, South and Korea. Unfortunately, New Zealand is supposed to be in this group. I couldn't get in touch with my colleagues in New Zealand for the feedback. Now, the other group is the, the countries belonging to the ASEAN region as well as Australia. And these countries have their own initial responses, uh, soft and in varying degrees, but of late in March onwards, they decided to have some kind of uh, formal responses in varying degrees. Malaysia, for instance, started a movement control order in 18 of March and right up to 20th of April. We keep reviewing every two weeks. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, Harris, yeah. Oh, sorry, I just want to show you the basic country data here. This is what happens. Uh, as you know, China has got the most uh, fatalities. And uh, but what's interesting is look at the uh, Northeast Asian countries, uh, Taiwan, South Korea, and Japan, they got very low. Uh, uh, Taiwan, for example, just across the streets, has got only 376 cases and five deaths. And the other issue, of course, is the number of uh, doctors in the front line who are victims of these uh, pandemics. And of course, mainly it's due to the lack of PPEs. As you see, China has got 60 doctors who become victims. South Korea has got one. Malaysia has got none. Actually, there was a doctor who died, but not directly, I say, not working the front line. He was, has a history of travel to Turkey. Uh, Philippines and Indonesia, 20 and 30. So as you can see, the advantage of having started very early with aggressive measures, like what our colleagues in the Northeast Asian countries are doing. Next slide, please. Next slide, okay. Now, the other question is, how do the GPs themselves engage in this whole pandemic? So. Um, there are two groups here. One is those who can engage themselves positively, and the other one is those who just cannot get involved at all for whatever reason as listed there. Now, positively, they, those who are really engaging, like those in China and Australia and some Singapore and Hong Kong as well, they are fully engaged and they are in the front line, they do screening, they do telehealth. 
Whereas indirect, uh, indirect engagement would be like training, doing workshops for their colleagues and for the communities. And uh, like Philippines, for example, they have what they call a COVID-19 task force that generate projects for members and the communities. Now, the negative effects, uh, this is a very common problem amongst most countries where the private GPs face a sudden reduction in the daily patient load. And this has become a financial issue because most of them are now facing this uh, temporary closures and some are looking at possible permanent closures because uh, when you're in private practice, there's a lot of competition, especially in Malaysia also. Then there's also the other issue of the lack of PPEs and without the proper PPEs, there are risks involved in getting directly engaged. Some countries, even like Malaysia, we don't have a formal mechanism of how GPs should come in should such an incident occur. And finally, there's also the lack of training and the lack of personal capacity most amongst most of these GPs. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, this is the final one, just to show the latest data on Malaysia. Uh, there's actually 76 deaths as of today, 446 cases. Now, the headlines read that uh, the movement control order, which has been imposed from 18 of March until the end of April, it has slashed the R0 by three times from 3.5 to 1. We are trying to go below 1, which is why we are reviewing until the end of, the, on, on, uh, end of April. And should it is not be satisfactory, then we probably go for another two weeks, and every two weeks for review. The others, uh, of course, the other one shows the latest number that this is our DG, uh, Dr. Hisham, and the, where Malaysia stands amongst the rest of the world. And fortunately, we're doing very well. Uh, that's it. Uh, last slide, please. Uh, final slide, please. Uh, thank you. That's a new monument. Some of us are thinking that's actually a war memorial in Kuala Lumpur. So we're having a new memorial in the, to uh, as a thank you to our frontliners. Thank you all. Sorry, thank you, Husni. Um, we now move to the Eastern Mediterranean region and to Dr. Jinan Usta, who's president of Wonka EMR. So Jinan, over to you. In late January, and since then, the numbers have been increasing more or less rapidly to the extent that we had doubling of the cases in the past uh, week now with um, uh, Yemen identifying the case uh, a new case in the uh, past two days now uh, almost uh, the 22 countries of the uh, region are being affected by uh, COVID next please now uh, there are several activities that have been act, uh, that have been working in order uh, to flatten the curve and decrease as much as possible the load on the healthcare. Now, one could say that uh, the response has for the governments have been relatively early in many countries. We have screening at quarters of entries. We have also stopped all religious congregations uh, so that the spread of the virus would be more or less contained. Most of the countries have adopted the lockdown or strict confinement in their own uh, houses. Now we are having more and more testing and we have several places adopting drive-through testing and definitely with tracing of the uh, contacts. Uh, there are also governments who have placed mandatory face marks mandatory face mark whenever people are going out, even for minor uh, outings like shopping. Um, and also uh, we have, most countries have adopted healthcare facilities separate for uh, patients who are having uh, COVID. Still, we have a lot of challenges in the region. Definitely we have, like in many places, shortages of uh, PPEs and uh, testing kits. Also, we have shortage of healthcare providers. Some of them are getting infected or even dead. And even when somebody is exposed, they are being put on isolation and therefore we have uh, less uh, of uh, healthcare uh, providers. We also have a more or less particular problem in uh, the Middle East, which is uh, in meshed families and we have elderly living 
house in the household that we're not able to isolate because of the setups in uh, our um, homes. So, and we know that uh, the elderly are at high risk, so that's a challenge. And definitely we have a difficulty to enforce confinement, especially in low income areas where the people depend on their daily uh, work to earn a living. Now, uh, one thing good is that uh, we have a lot of uh, community response who's helping also the uh, healthcare in fighting uh, the COVID pandemic. Now, uh, many places are adopting local manufacturing of face masks. Some of them are giving it for free or uh, at very reduced prices. And also there are people who are providing free residence for uh, healthcare providers to stay close to the hospital so that they don't have to go back to their houses and uh, worry about their families being infected. Next, please, Harry. Now, what uh, are the family medicine are doing in the region? Definitely, they are uh, helping in the awareness and in uh, testing. They are at the front line in uh, most of the areas of the region. They are, some of them, they have, uh, like in Iran, they have uh, developed self-assessment screening app where people at home, they can uh, uh, answer a questionnaire and they would know whether they are at high risk and therefore they can go and get tested. Now, uh, some places have started already the telemedicine under the uh, big heading of a doctor for every citizen. Uh, the, uh, family doctors are also collaborating with other professionals, including dentistry in fighting the epidemic. And also we have uh, in Lebanon the uh, community involvement with the municipalities. The uh, family physicians are associating with municipalities in almost every uh, town and they are uh, working at the advisory group and helping in uh, providing uh, counseling for, uh, for uh, patients. Now there are also some activities or some um, uh, things that have been done to increase the healthcare force. Uh, there have been some flexibility uh, in renewing license so people can work without having to uh, go over the process of renewing the licenses. Also, also some modifications for the requirements in, in these exceptional situations. A lot of capacity building activities have been going on, like training, uh, protocols, guidelines, webinars. Uh, residents have been quite involved as also uh, um, frontliners. Now there are still other activities we're contemplating, like uh, delivering primary health care. We're not forgetting about the other like NCDs and other problems that uh, considering that COVID may stay for a while, these are populations that we have also to take into consideration. So it is something that we're planning ahead, how to deliver care for them in, uh, uh, through telemedicine or other forms. Uh, providing mental health uh, support for patients affected with COVID because they are quite anxious, they are isolated, and they feel um, uh, mentally um, uh, down. Also for healthcare providers who are caring for uh, uh, COVID patients who are also so much stressed and they definitely need a lot of support. And the last is uh, we're contemplating doing elder care at home so that we can keep protecting our elders and uh, not putting them at risk for uh, COVID. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Jinan. And um, a useful reminder, I think, about the mental health of the, of the care providers as well. Um, we really must remember them. Um, right, we move on now to Europe to Professor Mehmed Ungan, who's the Wonka Europe President. And um, can I remind you, Mehmed, to, to unmute yourself as you start. Uh, thank you, Garth. Um, I would like to start my words for, uh, for our colleagues and for the member organizations. Happy Easter. I think today uh, most of you would like to uh, celebrate the day with your families. And uh, I would just like to summarize some uh, spot things, but I will not give graphs and such kind of numbers to you here, because the European CDC and the WHO Europe websites are already having the very accurate numbers for the Europe, and Europe is a really diverse uh, continent if you compare with the other regions, I think. Uh, some of the countries already started uh, earlier to find to identify the cases and to uh, take the measures and uh, according to the cultural diversity some of the, the population the countries 
were really stick on the uh, pre uh, precautions and the measures. But uh, unfortunately, I can tell you that maybe it's not correct, it's not scientific yet, but it's an observation. When you look at the numbers, the southern countries have, uh, I think, have not been uh, uh, very uh, keen on uh, obeying the social isolation and such kind of things because of the uh, cultural um, variations. And they, before, it was an advantage for those countries to have very warm uh, relations and social contacts, but I think this time it's not a good advantage for them. And uh, when we look at the uh, Wonka Europe website, you will see that uh, the, there is a COVID-19 resources section, and uh, you, if you click it, you can just go to the numbers, the actual numbers through the European CDC and the WHO Europe. Um, there are some, of course, precautions and also changing measures in, across the Europe. Um, uh, some countries already, as I said, uh, started earlier and some of them, like Turkey, for example, the first case was 11th of March and increasing terribly right now. And they, the, the, when you look at the numbers, the numbers will change uh, in the next 15 days, as I see. But for some countries like Germany and the, the Nordic countries, Norway especially, I think Anna will tell, tell you more. And uh, those countries are already uh, started to think about how to trans, uh, the transition phase to the normalizing the life. So uh, the diversity is very, very, very uh, marked here in this uh, continent. What we have uh, had the predictions, we are, if you look at the predictions, I can practically tell you that because of this diversity, I think even in October, we will not be able to, uh, to travel freely, I think, uh, in Europe at least, because some of the countries will still have the fight against the corona and some of them already will be over. So what we did is Wonka Europe, uh, we tried to uh, design some kind of uh, statements for our member organizations to use them uh, uh, when they are communicating with their uh, local governments, uh, especially trying to take place in the uh, pandemic teams, uh, I mean the brain teams, they, uh, they would need the international support. So that's the reason those statements were very useful. I know many countries uh, use them and now they are in the uh, pandemic councils of the country. And uh, each country has a different need, of course. And uh, one of those uh, statements, the summary is you can see in the screen now, that we, we tried to uh, make a presidential letter and a video. So uh, in those statements, uh, we just mentioned that the, first of all, the family doctors has families also, uh, and, uh, and they, their families are needing them uh, for sure, and they have to protect themselves. And they have to be careful with healthy food and uh, careful work breaks, and the personal protective equipment, as shall be already mentioned, and uh, they have to limit face-to-face -face consultations to a minimum. And, and if while doing them, uh, they may use the uh, technology the, uh, wisely and uh, they can uh, um, think how to improve them in daily practice with new ethical and legal regulations which should be worked together with the government also. And uh, we have to be, we mentioned and uh, we discovered that we have to be extremely careful what to post on social media because we have an influential voice in our populations, uh, especially. So we have to minimize posting on social media to absolute science. And if this is uncertain, should think twice before posting. So um, the rest is uh, the family doctors also must urge their governments to include the, them uh, into pandemic management leading teams, as I told you. There should be call centers in some countries they have, but still in some countries there are no call center for the citizens. And I, it would be nice for the, uh, as the voice of the population, the family doctors could uh, continue to uh, insist on having these call centers for the public. If we can change it, I see. Met my chair, and, uh, five minutes already, so can, can I ask you to speed up just a little? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm sorry. Yes, and uh, there are three uh, items that I should have been mentioning. Uh, 
we are confident about the scientific decisions by the uh, by the uh, committees and councils, scientific councils, and the governments should also uh, rely on the science, which is the only truth. And uh, even the governments can follow all the precautions of sciences in each country without any political adaptation, which is very important, I think. And quarantine, isolation, surveillance, case detection, such kind of words should be used in the scientific meaning only. So this is also another one. And we can just change, and this is the last slide, um, I think. Yeah, just we try to work on the uh, occup occupational diseases uh, and try to include in some countries uh, the, the COVID-related disease to be an occupational disease for the family doctor's rights, and it should be accepted. And some countries already put them into their regulations. And uh, another very important uh, item is we are expecting an increase in the violence towards health professionals, in, uh, even in the Europe, uh, in some parts of the Europe. So I think it would be very important to, uh, to include the violence uh, uh, measures uh, towards the health workers in uh, the regulations. This is an important topic I, just, I should remind and also increasing the capacity by using uh, the family doctors associations uh, in collaboration with the governments. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much Mehmet. Um, and we now move on to Dr Jacqueline Ponzo. And Jacqueline is Wonka president for the Ibero-Americana CIMF region. So Jacqueline if you could unmute and we hand over to you. I need you to un unmute, Jacqueline. Good morning. Sorry. Good morning. Thank you. This is the situation of the pandemic in our nation. Between poetry and horror stories are words of young family doctors and teachers in Latin America. Our nation is Ibero America, includes Spain and Portugal too. Of course, these countries are part of Europe region, but are, are part of us too. The poetry are our prim, primary care teams in the front line. They work, empathy, commitment. Are the resident and students in primary care. It's the love of our patients that are used to. The horror are the death of young doctors. They work without protection. People without food and money for a stay at home. People dead for COVID in the street. Next, please. The pandemic traveled from east to west, so it arrived to America, uh, to continent Americano after other nations. You can see in the slide the evolution in the uh, American continent and look please Latin America between the first cast in February 26 and April 7 in the more colored map. The debt is a very big problem in our region. The graphics shows in orange and blue colors the case in Ibero-America. These are 14% of the world. But in black, you can see the deaths in Ibero-American for COVID. There is 18% of the world. Next, please. This slide shows the incidence of COVID in Ibero-America. Uh, this isn't numbers of cases. This is incidence rate, case in relation to population in each countries of our, our region and some other countries 
for reference. In blue is the incidence at March 23. In orange is the incidence at April 11. You can see the growth in the last two, three weeks, a big growth. And it's possible to see how in Latin America is just beginning. The wars don't arrive yet. About the countries is really severe the situation in Ecuador, where the incidence and mortality are very high, and more than 40 percent of cases are health workers. Next, please. These are the absolute numbers from Ibero and Latino America. You can see that if the evolution in Latin America are some Iberia, we can find 200,000 cases in a few weeks in our subcontinent, and the death will be are 10 times more than actually. So the last slide are focused in Latin America. Same. Next, please. Our challenge are the lack of tests in a lot of countries, lack of PPE resulting in illness and deaths of members of healthcare teams, insufficient hierarchization of primary care to contain the pandemic at the community level, erratic policies, insufficient protocol for COVID care, inadequate epidemiological surveillance, weakening of state investment in health, worsening of social and economic inequities, worsening of chronic illness, other comorbidities, and gender violence, coexistence of dengue, TB, and HIV, soon to start influence season. Next, please. COVID-19 is a community health problem. So this is opportunities. We have some opportunities about it. Family and community medicine have the best competence, clinicals, epidemiological, and communities for to stop the pandemic. Learning the lesson from Asia and Europe and to strong the primary care in the health system is opportunity but primary care health must with high quality, with enough resource for diagnosis and for the protection in the work. Next, please. Finally, the, my message for all is solidarity, equity, and health for, for us primary care and family medicine for the pandemic. Many thanks. Thank you, Jacqueline. Good, strong message to end there. Thank you very much. Um, we will head north now into North America and to Professor Marvin Reed, our Wonka president for the North America region. So Marvin, over to you and remember to unmute your mic. Thank you, Gareth. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good night to those of you in the with the internet um, citizens. Um, basically, uh, the focus of my discussion this morning will, will not be on numbers. There are adequate amount of um, information available on the numbers that the World Health Organization and the CDC and, and various other informatics sites. The North American region is characterized by a variable distribution of healthcare delivery between the public the sectors and, and the private sectors. Um, and in addition to that, it's a region that is characterized by marked health inequalities, both in terms of the level of the clients and at the level of healthcare delivery. So I thought I'll focus my discussion this morning on, on really three themes that have emerged in discussing this issue with my colleagues across the region. 
And the first of this theme relates to the impact that the COVID-19 pandemic will have or is having on the delivery of healthcare um, worldwide. So we recognize that especially in, in countries where there's a large primary, um, private sector involvement, um, that there will be significant financial and psychological impact um, of COVID, um, both in, from the family physician standpoint as well as from our clients. Um, many practices are becoming bankrupt and many uh, hospital systems um, are actually laying off um, staff. Family physicians have been called upon um, to assist uh, individuals at the secondary care level, at the hospital care levels um, in many of the countries. And this really just demonstrates the versatility and the scope of practice um, of family physician. Within this context, there is clearly a need for family physician to be adequately resourced and trained with the appropriate tools, um, including um, personal protective equipment that they will need to execute these functions efficiently. It is clear, especially in regions or countries where there is a, a high proportion of family physicians in the private sectors, that family physician must be included in the deployment of any surveillance system if adequate numbers or preparations um, are going to be made. Um, and we recognize that there's going to be um, post-COVID a further um, introduction of appropriate technology infrastructure, for example, telehealth or telemedicine, both for in-office as well as outside of office um, consultations. And this will become a more um, established or entrenched aspect of delivery of care as we move forward. Next slide. The second major theme that has emerged is the role of family physicians in advocacy, both within our groups and between our groups. And we not only advocate or should be advocating not only for um, work-related or occupational health-related issues, but also issues related to human rights, especially those of our vulnerable group, ethics in terms of how things, uh, how resources are made available whenever um, resources are scarce, equity, um, which is important, so there's equal opportunities for individuals to access care, uh, especially for those in the private sector, certainly we have to be advocating with our um, private providers, our health insurance companies, and more importantly, to be all inclusive in terms of our response to this pandemic. Clearly, this pandemic also affirm, um, affirms the role of family physicians in health systems, and therefore we have to work in partnerships with national departments and Ministry of Health. We clearly will have to work with them to strengthen the health system, and certainly in the level of um, infection prevention and control measures, surveillance, research, and of course, clinical case management. Next slide. The third theme that has emerged from our deliberations and discussion is the whole concept of comprehensiveness. Notwithstanding the pandemic, which has caused traumatic transformation of all the healthcare delivery system, uh, especially because of the surge on hospital and ICU capacities, family physicians are still actively caring um, for members of the community with particular focus on vulnerable groups. So the North American region is characterized by um, a high proportion of comorbidities, especially hypertension and diabetes, and, and these individuals still need care whether they become infected or not. Um, we do have other vulnerable groups included um, or disabled or elderly. Material and child health services still have to be maintained. Um, and we do play a role in providing some support for all members of the healthcare team. Um, in some particular regions or countries, HIV is still a significant con um, comorbidity, as well as um, the genetic disorder called sickle cell disease. So notwithstanding the pandemic, these vulnerable groups still need care and family physicians are very active on the front line, um, ensuring that there's a continuity of care for these individuals with these respective comorbidities. And those, that summarizes and concludes my, my um, thought this morning. That's great, Marvin. Thank you very much indeed. And a, a good emphasis at the end there. On, on the patients who still have all the other comorbidities and all the other chronic diseases that we as family doctors still have to manage. So thank you for that. 
Um, over now to Dr. Raman Kumar, who is the Wonka president for the South Asia region. So Raman, over to you and unmute your microphone. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Garth. Uh, oh, so as rest of the world, we have some special consideration. Uh, in South Asia, we have the largest population, human population, almost 25% of the whole uh, human beings live in our region. So it's, it's difficult and it is very challenging to just think about, you know, if we really get this pandemic escalated to what we have currently and whether we have uh, resources available to uh, address such a huge public health crisis, the crisis of the century. Next slide, please. So uh, this is the current numbers, you know, although not very large compared to what we see in uh, Europe and uh, United States, but it started, it has started to picking up. Uh, we have around uh, 8,000 plus positive cases in India and some 250 plus deaths. And similarly, we have similar figures in Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka are somewhat uh, lagging. We have fewer cases in Nepal and surprisingly in Maldives, we have 19 positive cases. Uh, but these numbers uh, uh, would be, you know, picking up. There are many theories why, you know, the numbers are yet uh, very low in South Asian region. Uh, primarily in our understanding because uh, it arrived a month later, uh, but uh, it is gradually picking up and most of our countries, there have been restriction of movement, screening at the airports and uh, 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 quarantine and isolation of the potential contacts and patients. And this is probably, you know, uh, has worked for a while, but we have to see what happens in coming few uh, weeks time. Next slide, please. So as I said earlier, we have a huge population to cater to, and uh, mostly our health systems are uh, underfunded. Uh, although we have some development in past two, three, four decades, but still uh, to be able to meet such big pandemic is a challenge for all of the countries in our region. We also have, you know, hugely uh, a very dense population and uh, communities living together. And we have average population uh, family size larger in our region and elderly people often live with the families. So uh, uh, it's, it's big family units are also bigger in our region. And then we have almost 60 to 70% of our population living in rural areas, which is again a challenge to protect uh, our rural population. And after the lockdown has been called in most of our countries, uh, is also talk about the economic consequences of lockdown on the, you know, um, uh, the poorer section of the society and who do not have any formal employment. And uh, there is, you know, a threat of, uh, 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 you know, more people going into poverty. Uh, there's an issue of hunger, food availability, but at the moment, we are able to manage because of the low numbers. Most of these cases, uh, because large of number of South Asian people work abroad, you know, like people from India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, also from Sri Lanka and uh, other countries, work in Middle Eastern countries. A uh, lot of people turn back, uh, back from Europe. We have uh, a very uh, vibrant, business relationship with China, students and businessmen going to China, they return back. So most of the initial cases which have come to our region are through this, you know, international travelers. And uh, there is officially not yet, uh, you know, uh, acknowledged, but we are almost on the verge of community transmission. Um, but we will have to see how it unfolds in the coming uh, few weeks. Uh, Next slide, please. So, few things we are just, you know, uh, thinking that, you know, this may protect, you know, as I said, there's delayed impact. We have a younger population because as we see through data, most of the people who are dying uh, are the elderly people in, in Europe and United States. And 
it is also being discussed that since we have you know higher load of infectious diseases and prior exposure to several uh, kinds of viruses in our region probably we have some herd immunity or so but this is still uh, has to be uh, you know uh, tested on time uh, there is talk about uh, you know bcg vaccination for uh, tuberculosis which is protecting and you know also talk about you know the anti malarials people um, might have been taking in on prophylaxis basis may be protecting our population there is also huge uh, uh, curiosity about india because of the population 1.3 billion and diversity how we are able to manage it i would say uh, in uh, india the response of the government has been very very swift from the beginning itself uh, screening at the airports and uh, tracking uh, those who travel to international uh, destinations and the public health system has become very very uh, active across india through you know we have a federal system where the central government and uh, state governments of 29 provinces work together and this is indeed a, you know good to see how this government uh, establishments have come together to work and protect the population in india we also through past 2 3 decades have good capacity of private hospitals but the challenge is uh, how to organize the finances and the crisis of pandemic level uh, at the moment we have a sufficient number of icus and ventilators in the cities and urban areas but it may be challenging in future and by the time we have this lockdown going on across india and south asian region it will give our government some time to prepare the south asian uh, population is still at risk and we will know in future how we have done but at the moment all stakeholders are together to uh, meet this disaster next please the last slide and uh, i'm very proud to say that all the family physician groups in south asia have come together to issue this statement of solidarity on covid-19 pandemic and because we have similar challenges of uh, public health system health system deficiency or the issues related to population and uh, poverty and uh, such thing so all family doctors have come together we actively share our uh, ideas we share the the interventions we are doing in our communities in most of our countries uh, many doctors have started doing teleconsultations and uh, shifting on technological models and uh, there are good things also in india at the moment we are not directly participating in covid Uh, care because it is largely being taken care of by the public health or the government systems, but gradually when it spreads into community, if at all, we will have huge challenge. And then probably more family would be required to work in the community and with the uh, government health systems. So this is all from the South Asia region at the moment. Great. Thank you. Thank Thank you very much, Raman. Right, you've heard from all seven regions, and I'd now like to pass over to Anna Stavdal, our president-elect, um, for her comments, um, both on what she's heard so far and any other comments that she might she might want to make. So, Anna, over to you. Thank you, and greetings from Oslo. Um, we've been in, in lockdown for four weeks. Uh, restrictions will be lifted in two days, gradually and cautiously. Interestingly, I will not go into that because that was not my task, but it has been a discussion in the region between the Nordic countries which have chosen different strategies to meet the COVID pandemic. And we are very close and we are small countries uh, with no borders, uh, free migration, uh, common labor market. Um, and the discussion has been along the lines of how to achieve the herd immunity shall we control the pandemic from the start trying to control from the start um so it's been interesting and we don't know the outcomes yet but we are in a fortunate situation i must say compared to many of the reports i've heard now in the nordic all the nordic countries um listening to the reports and thank you everyone it is striking um that the family medicine despite that the family medicine environment internationally 
is characterized by a vast diversity in practice models, in training programs, financial resources, the core values are the same. We are delivering continuous personal and comprehensive care committed to the communities in which we practice. Um, but these values are currently challenged by, by general societal trends. And I think the pandemic makes it more visible to us how these trends influence medicine and healthcare. Fragmentation, commercialization, and digitalization, just to mention a few. So what I hear is that we observe closely how the pandemic affects our populations. We are bearing witness of how the vulnerable groups in our communities are those who suffer the most. Suffer the most from the lockdowns and also from the infection itself. And also how the pandemic widens the social gap and increase health inequalities. So what are we doing? We are pleading for adequate and sufficient amounts of personal protection equipment. And we are pointing out the need for a sufficient, uh, sufficient number of test kits, as we've heard, for our patients and ourselves. We have started employing telemedicine tools, uh, like video consultations, uh, screening apps for patient self-assessment. And in many cases, this has been introduced overnight without, or in many cases, without digital skills for professionals and digital health literacy for patients. That's a challenge. And as primary care advocates, I think we also observe a trend to politicize the pandemic. And that is serious. It's, it might give rise to deeper conflicts in the time to come. And we have to be vigilant because we don't want it to, to lead to an increase of the already existing aggressive nationalism which we can see many places. We hope for more and not less international solidarity. So in this reality, it is impressive how family doctors around the world are adapting, regardless of differences in healthcare infrastructure and political environment. If I should try and summarize what I hear uh, from what you've said, um, and also from, from my own, background and say, what shall, shall our response be? Um, maybe in the clinical setting, we must ask ourselves how we can make the adequate risk assessment for the different patient groups in our populations to secure that vulnerable groups, including those not infected by the virus, receive the care they need. After all, most people do not contract the virus, but they go on living their lives with the same disease burden as before. The public health approach is important, being disease-oriented now and population-based, but it needs to be integrated with primary care in order to be efficient and serve the purpose. This pandemic can be a showcase for integration of primary care and public health. And we must also engage in the debate on capacity building in primary care. The interprofessional team is the operating unit. And we can't do our job without other health professionals. Maybe the pandemic will force us to look at new practice models in some regions. And after the emergency retrocedes and we return to the new normal, we must be vigilant and not leave future digital development in healthcare to tech technologists alone. 
We must secure that family doctors are engaged in the development, the implementation and the evaluation of the digital tools, which are being helping us now and helping our patients now. Last but not least, we must work for international solidarity and I'm proud to see that that is what we're doing right now. It comes down to spending our resources where we best can impact health outcomes. So lots of healthy individuals make for healthy communities and societies and a healthy international community. Health for all. And that is our goal. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anna. Uh, now, whilst all the presentations have been going on, um, three of our colleagues, Pratish Kumar, Joy Mugambi and Sonia Tsutagochi, have been um, monitoring the Q&A line and the, and, the, and the chat line. So I'm going to ask each of them in turn um, to give us a, a question, whether to an individual panel member or to all the panel members. So Pratyush, first of all, um, would you like, have there been any particular themes or any or, or particular question that you would like to put to the panel generally or to one specific member? Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Pratyush Kumar and just going by the questions, uh, here are some specific questions for Dr. Husni Jamal that what was the main strategy to have such a good result in Malaysia? And the next question is how is strategy of movement controlled order adopted by Malaysia different from circuit breaker strategy adopted by Singapore? Thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, first of all, I, I must say that um, we belong to that second group. As I told you, the ASEAN countries, we did not respond as aggressively as our North Asian counterparts. Uh, there was a certain uh, period where there were certain uh, various, uh, various interpretations as to whether people should come in fast or to hold on and see the situation. I think the government on the day that we started on that response, but there was a situation, there were circumstances that we couldn't come in earlier. There were at the same time, I don't want to elaborate on that. But uh, what made the decision was because as things go by, the government that came in decided to put a hole on this and started what we call the movement control order as the only way to to uh, to stop this peaking of uh, incidences that we are seeing. So this movement control order, as we, a day before actually, we were with the new minister and it, the issue was whether we should have complete lockdown or a restriction of movement. Now there are two, uh, the issue now is if we go off total lockdown, it's going to be chaotic. Uh, people are caught in 24 hours. There's a lot of things you'll be caught up with. So it would have been a better approach to go for an MCO, a movement control order, whereby uh, live, the essential services are allowed, but everybody else stays in the house, uh, self-quarantine in that sense. Now, the first two weeks was uh, not very well taken by the majority of the citizenry because they thought, well, it's not a very big issue. But as the cases, there were some clusters, uh, the three or four different clusters, mainly a couple from religious groups and a couple from other smaller sources that balloons and then people start to worry. And then the second week came in with stronger measures. We are now in the second week and the review is done for every two weeks. So at this last recent, uh, last Friday, the prime minister decided that um, we will go for another two weeks. So it looks like we are going for the next six weeks. So the movement control order really means that everybody else stays at home, wherever you are. There is no way that if your family is split one up north or somewhere else in the south studying, whatever, you are not to come back. Uh, there was an issue in the first few days when this came in, everybody starts. There was a mass movement on the highways and the government decided to put a stop. So we are seeing results now uh, in the second half, but the Ministry of Health, uh, the team from the Ministry of Health feels that it is still a bit too early. So what is of uh, concern now for Malaysia is Ramadan is coming in another one week. And in the Malaysian situation, when Ramadan comes, it's another celebration. Everybody goes back home, most of them, uh, to celebrate. And then one month after then comes the Eid celebrations and another massive migration. So 
Personally, can I? Can the I, can yeah, I speak? the medical people feel that we should go on more. This MCO should go on for a certain period more time. Yeah. Lovely. Thank, thank you, thank you Isney. Um, Joy, um, do you have a question? That has there been a particular theme or um, any question for the panel in general or for a specific panelist? Are you unmuted, Joy? We've lost Joy. Harris, can you unmute Joy or have we lost her? Uh, yeah, I think uh, we lost okay. Joy, so shall we pass to Sonia? Yeah, Sonia, would you have a question for us, please? Um, thank you, Garth. Um, yes, I do. So I am fielding the questions from Facebook, where we have members from Uruguay, Malaysia, Colombia, Pakistan, Japan, Puerto Rico, USA, Bulgaria, and Bosnia and Brazil. Wow. Responding. So we've got a good um, cross section of the world here. Um, my question is actually from Elena from Spain. Um, so her question is that obviously the intensivists are, get, are quite rightly getting recognition for their incredible skill and their talent and their contribution to the fight to COVID. But as family physicians, we're carrying the invisible burden of all the non-COVID diseases. And we are making sure that the healthcare system is still running and that everyone is getting some form of healthcare. So um, her question is, um, how do you, do you believe that the silent and unrecognized but heroic performance of family doctors in this pandemic gives us enough reason to ask for the respect, sorry, for respect for our profession, its recognition and a necessary consequent financial subsidy? And that is for um, all panelists. Thank you. Art is in silence. Anybody else want to take the point? Anna Stavdal? No, no. I mean, I think I think it's 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 a really good point, um, and I think it it I think Donald through his president's columns um, have you know, has been, have been emphasising. The, the important role of family doctors in, in every country. And he's constantly talked about, you know, as family doctors, we are first in, last out. And so, um, I mean, huge kudos to him for constantly emphasizing that and also for publishing a number of articles and commentaries, which I think highlight the role of family doctors. Um, because it is very true, they're in, intimately involved, I think, in most countries in dealing with not just the COVID patients, but the non-COVID patients, but they're also going to have to deal with the aftermath of it, um, you know, in, in, with all the mental health issues that I think will go on for, for many months and many years to come. So um, thank you to Elena, I think, for, for highlighting that as a, as, a, as a point. And I think we would all agree that it's really important and we, we, we have to keep emphasizing to, to our governments that family doctors are absolutely vital and pivotal um, in, 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 in any health problem like this. Um, I, 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 I want to just add a, 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 sure. a <clears throat> comment to this. I think it's not just recognition. This is the perfect time for us to reinforce our trusted relation, continuous relation with patients. We may not be right up there in the front of the epidemic, but we are there and we can always ask how our patients are, you know, whether the family is all right, if there's been contacts, you know, we can keep their health, you know, and, and just check on them. And no better way than to build relations, I think, during these challenging times. This is the best time, besides offering our continuous service, but just really a now and then, just a call to see how your patients are, you know, whether their families are affected and other, I think this is the best time to build these relations. Yeah, that's what I want to hide. Uh, thank you, Donald. Um, I don't think we've got Joy back on. So Pratyush, do you have another question for us? <clears throat> yeah, well, like uh, on the Facebook chat and this uh, Zoom chat, we are seeing more discussion on uh, telemedicine platforms. Like there's sudden more consultations happening on telemedicine 
platforms. So um, more interested to know about your experiences, like how you're adapting to from in-person consultation to online consultations. Like, do you finding it easy uh, for yourself and how the patients are getting adapted to this telemedicine consultations? And also about uh, the some technical difficulties in consulting elderly patients. Thank you. Anyone can answer this question, this general question for everyone. Yeah, would anybody like to comment on their experiences so far with telemedicine? Um, how the patients react, how, how easy or difficult you have found it? Viviana, can you answer first? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the, the experience in telehealth is variable across the board. One of the discoveries we have done is that people at home were more prepared than we had estimated that um, many communities do have access to uh, phones and with the help of personnel that help people download some of the apps that were needed, people who were chronically non-connected with health systems have been able to connect through telehealth. So telehealth has a real role in multiple communities across the world. The, 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 the idea here is how to do it. Some of the discoveries that I have had with my own patients is that it has become more almost as if, as if doing a home visit because they are actually showing me pictures on the world. I'm able to assess not just their health status, but their mental health status and their ability to link to others. And they're linking, we as family physicians are becoming their link to the outside world when isolation is taken in place. So I really propose that we, we work as hard as possible to try to connect with those who are more disenfranchised, that sometimes phone or telephone lines can actually be very helpful in a situation like this one. Thank you, Vivi. I mean, I think um, there are a number of, of tentative steps in all, sort, all walks of life that have been slowly, slowly developing, whether it be cashless society or telemedicine or whatever. And I think what this crisis has done has massively accelerated those processes and so we're, we're probably many years further on now in testing the result and that may be the way forward. That, uh, um, Sonia would you have one more question? Oh sorry. I just want to respond to the fact that telemedicine or digitalization is also the risk of the equity divide becoming even bigger and I think we should also be wary of that digital divide being worsened with communities like in Africa where it's not as easy, but uh, I think it's nonetheless. Sure, uh, good point. Zimmer and Raman also wanted to answer this question. Mm. Yeah. Anna? Yeah. Um, I, 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 I can absolutely submit to the experiences uh, shared here, but also new with video consultations, new for myself in my clinical practice. I can see we can we can also fall into the other <laughs> ditch on the other side of the road and idolize um, this way of communication because of course it, it there are shortcomings and limitations also but absolutely so we have to keep both um, both in our when we and that is what I meant actually when in the aftermath of this we have to look into how we are developing the tools and how we're using them. Yeah, I think, I mean, there's, there's an obvious need for assessment um, in, the, in the cooler calm of, of dawn, but yes, thank you. Was, did Mehmet want to come in on that? I'm sorry, I, I missed, no? Mehmet, were you, did, you, did you want to make a comment? Uh, yeah, uh, just, just I think I already made, uh, the comments are already made, but I think I can tell you that uh, in, the, in many countries in Europe, uh, there is also another problem, not only uh, in teleconsultations, but there should be also, we have to be very careful that that, that should be permitted by the government. This is an important issue for us in order not to have a problem later. And I have, I know that in Israel, um, they are using telemedicine very widely and there is a very, <coughs> a, how do you say, developed equipment uh, which is on the market and they are using it at home and uh, this is interesting you can 
you make auscultation, you can make everything, you can measure the fever, blood pressure, and everything uh, from the screen. Just, just uh, you can go to the websites and you can see the other things. The infrastructure of the internet is very important also in online consultations, not only for. Thank you. I just want to add, I just want to add that, you know, Wonka, actually we have a, a working party on e-health and we've been doing some work uh, starting to look at, you know, teleconsultations, um, what should be there, how to keep the continuity, the comprehensive and also backup and also possibly moral hazards, you know, prescription without examination. We, we look at it from the whole range. It's just starting and we welcome ideas. So please, you know, contact our e-health uh, working party if you have views and all that. We've actually started a pilot uh, project to assess one of these internet consultation platforms. And I think we'll be publishing this uh, in the next few months and probably uh, at the World Wonka World Conference, we will be making uh, some kind of presentation on this uh, for those who are interested. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Donald. I'm, I'm, we're, we're actually well over the end of our time, so I think it, I, I'm going to have to wrap up, unfortunately. Um, lots of chat, lots of Q's and A's, um, some of which our, our moderators have been able to, to deal with. So thank you to Pratyush and Sonia. We've had a WhatsApp. Joy has had to rush off to a medical emergency, which is why she's she's no longer uh, available. So may I hand over back to back to Donald um, to, for his closing remarks? Thanks, Donald. Well, thank you everybody for for joining us. You know, I, I think uh, we've had a good exposure of what is happening around different regions. Um, before I end, I uh, want to do some advertising about the next Sunday, the the second webinar. Uh, it's going to be on mental health, um, and this will be moderated by Chris Dorwick, the chair of the Wonka Working Party for Mental Health, with contributions from WHO and also across the Wonka regions. We'll consider how COVID-19 affects everyone's well-being, how patients with pre-existing mental illnesses are at particular risk, and how we family doctors can safeguard the mental health of our patients and ourselves. So please stay tuned next Sunday, same time, uh, same arrangement. Uh, we will have actually more topics to come, including that on education and training, quality and safety, primary health and universal health coverage, rural practice, family violence, etc., etc. But before I sign off and end, I would like to repeat again what I said earlier. Um, uh, we don't know what's going to happen in the next few weeks or months, but we know enough to understand that COVID-19 will test our capacities to be kind and generous and to see beyond ourselves and our own interests. We at Wonka is here for you, for mutual support. Um, all our family doctors together, solidarity, advocacy. Our task now is to bring the best of who we are and what we do to a world that is more complex and more confused than any of us would like it to be. So let's all proceed with wisdom and grace. So thank you very much for coming. And thank you, Donald, for, for those lovely remarks. Um, thank you very much to our panelists. Um, really appreciate your inputs. Thanks to Pratyush and Joy and Sonia for their questions. And thanks very much to Harris for organizing. We hope very much that you will join us next Sunday at 1300 GMT for the mental health webinar then. So uh, I wish you all um, a pleasant rest of Sunday and if it's a bank, if it's a holiday weekend for you, have a good holiday weekend. Thanks all, thanks, bye-bye. Thank you.